It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 160, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Stacy Carlberg and Casey Gustavaro manage the farm at Sunnyside with 12 acres of vegetables and 8 acres of fruit trees in Rappahannock County, Virginia, about 70 miles from Washington, D.C. You'll note that I said manage instead of own, and we dig into the ups and downs of managing another person's farm, including why they've chosen to do it and how the farm owners set expectations and provide oversight. Stacy provides insights into how they manage the financial implications, and we look at some of the other goals of the property owners and how those fit and don't necessarily fit with a vegetable farming operation. Casey and Stacy share how they make the most of their spot at the high-quality, high-volume DuPont Circle Farmers Market in Washington, D.C., including strategies for standing out from the crowd and how they manage their employees at the stand. We also talk about how Casey has worked to fit cover crops into the vegetable rotation and how they have integrated laying hens into the cover crop rotation, including the steps they've taken to ensure the safety of their fresh produce in the face of nearby chicken poop. And Stacy and Casey share the steps they've taken to manage employees for year-over-year retention, from their overall staffing strategy to their day-to-day communications. And finally, we discuss their experience with Lyme disease among the crew and the steps they have taken to reduce its incidence among their employees. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop-growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high-quality compost and compost-based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com And by Local Food Marketplace, helping farms and food hubs around North America implement easy-to-use online ordering systems that integrate with a full management system for order packing, invoicing, and payment processing. Contact LocalFoodMarketplace.com to learn more. And by Haas Tools. Haas Tools is the complete solution for all your market farming tools and supplies. From wheel hose, precision seeders, heavy-duty seed trays, drip irrigation, and pest control, they've got you covered. Get free shipping and outstanding customer service at HaasTools.com. Stacy Carlberg and Casey Gustavaro, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Hello, thanks for having us. We're happy to be here. Really pleased that you could join us today. So I'd like to start off by having you tell us a little bit about the farm at Sunnyside. How many acres of vegetables are you guys growing? Where are you doing that? And how are you getting that product to market? All right. So we are in Rappahannock County, Virginia. Um, It actually borders the Shenandoah National Park, right in the foothills of the mountains. Um, It's a beautiful part of the country. We're about 70 miles from Washington, D.C., and we grow veggies on about 12 acres. Um, here. And then we also have about eight acres of tree fruit, Asian pears, and certified organic apples, and uh, an acre of blackberries. Are you primarily marketing that produce in Washington, D.C.? Yes, that is um, our main area of marketing. We go to three farmers markets, um, two of them in the D.C. area, and then one small local market. And we have a small CSA program. 50 members um, that serves our local community here. We have one drop off nearby. And then we do some restaurant sales um, in the DC area and some locally as well. You guys are farm managers at the farm at Sunnyside, right? Yeah, that is correct. Um, We've kind of made a decision to, at least for the time being, manage farm property rather than make the decision to own something and take the risk of buying all the equipment, buying land. We like farming in this area um, and land around here is pretty expensive. This is where we've always, both of us have worked on a variety of farms in the area. We like the farm community here and we've decided not to kind of branch out and try to buy something here or lease land here, but kind of opportunities have come up to to manage other people's property. So you said that you've, chosen to manage properties instead of buying your own place and and farming with your own equipment and taking the risks that are involved with that. But I'm curious, was that a was that a conscious choice where you went and sought out farms to manage? Or was this something that where where these opportunities became available and you said, yeah, that's a direction that I think we'd like to head in? That's a good question. Um, I would say these opportunities have come up more organically just from being tied to the farm community here. Casey and I both worked as interns on farms in the area, and we really embraced the farm community, touring other farms and and getting to know folks that 
grow how we like to grow. And after three years of working on other farms, we were approached by Potomac Vegetable Farms to help manage one of the branches of their farm. So that was our first opportunity to dip our toe into the management world. And um, we were there for four years. And then this other opportunity came along to return to the farm at Sunnyside, where we had both previously worked as interns and I would say middle managers before. So I think it's possible if these opportunities hadn't come along, we would have chosen to start our own farm, but we haven't seen the need to do that thus far. And as somebody who who managed farms for other people, as well as had my own farm for a much longer period of time, I know that, I mean, there's some really great things about managing a farm for somebody else. That's true. <laughs> as Casey mentioned, we, I think we're both a little bit risk averse in terms of being in debt or you know, spending a lot of money on, on an enterprise we're not sure is going to work out. So, you know, we've been very fortunate to adopt farm systems that already have infrastructure in place and already have equipment, and we've been put on salary. Um, so there's definite benefits to all of those things. Can you tell me a little bit more about the arrangement that you have with the farm owners? Um, sure. So... We get to manage the the day to day, make all the day to day decisions, um, what we want to grow, um, how we want to market it in general. Um, most of those things are things that we can decide. Some of those things were established beforehand, and we've kind of branched out from them or make little tweaks here and there. But we don't have any, as of yet, don't have any long-term equity um, in the business. Perhaps that might change in the future, but our main benefits are having salary benefits and, and also making a lot of the, the hiring decisions um, and getting to run, run our crew exactly how we want to. There's not much interference there. And I think that's something that you know, is not always the case. We, we've heard of other situations where people are managing farms and you know, there's a lot of uh, kind of interactions and interference from the owners with, or the board of a nonprofit farm or things like that. I don't feel like we have much interference there and we're given a lot of leeway to make most of those decisions, which we feel we're, we're very lucky um, to have that, that situation. So what kind of oversight do the owners of the farm actually provide to you guys then? I mean, there must be some expectations about how you're going to perform and and what you're actually going to do on the farm. Yeah, I would say that is very true. Um, we do have regular meetings with the owners of the farm. Um, prior to us arriving here, um, you know, the farm business was relatively new and still figuring things out, I think, and was not as of yet profitable. We've kind of change that dynamic so that it is profitable now. And that was, you know, one of the main goals. Um, one thing that I think we brought to the table is just being a, a two person team and we have very different skills and different kind of responsibilities on the farm. And prior to us being here, there was generally one manager and I think it was a little too much for one person at times to manage the, the operation here. Uh, so, so there definitely is some oversight, um, but that was one of the main goals of us coming here um, was to change that that dy dynamic. And luckily, that that has happened so far. Other oversight things that the the owners work with us on are larger management decisions of kind of what's going to happen with with the business in the long term. Some of those things about equity and benefits and kind of some larger scale staff decisions as we would like to bring more people on the farm potentially that become part of the staff and have some benefits. So is that something that the farm can really support? Um, so those would be kind of the more, more oversight and decisions that the, the farm owners would be involved in. But all the the day to day decisions and a lot of the marketing decisions are left up to us. Just to go along with that, I mean, we do manage the budget and the bookkeeping, and as Casey said, we were 
really happy we transitioned this business to be a profitable one. And um, so that entails me watching the numbers very closely. And then if we want to make any big purchases, we have the freedom to propose those ideas to the owners of the business and they have to give us the green light. But we've, I think because of our performance, they trust us and we have a pretty good relationship where we can talk about what we need and why and how much it'll cost. And then, you know, we can go ahead and essentially spend the money that we have, you know, helped put in the bank account from our hard work. So now the farm, I mean, you mentioned that it's got the, it's got the vegetables, but then there's also this, this apple and Asian pear and blackberry component. Are you guys managing that side of the operation as well? Um, Yes, we do oversee that part of the operation, but we're lucky enough to have one other person on full-time staff here. His name is Alfredo and he precedes the Laphams and ownership of the farm. And there was an operation going on here prior and they were actually doing even more things and had livestock on the farm. But Alfredo has been here for almost 20 years now. And he does a lot of the the management of the, the orchard and the blackberry operation. So we kind of oversee some things there and do a lot of make all the marketing decisions, but he does all the pruning and most of the the harvesting of that. So we're very lucky to have him here. And he does, he helps a lot with the veggie side of the operation as well in terms of tractor work and irrigation. But that is, you know, another added part to this business for sure. Um, We like having the certified organic fruit. There's not many people in this region growing organic fruit and it, it adds a nice piece to our marketing outlets, but we definitely, in terms of our seasonal staff and our management, most of our time is definitely dedicated to the veggie side of the operation. The vegetables and the, the orchard exist within the context of a 400 acre property there. And just judging from your website, there's a lot of effort that's going into managing that non-productive land, excuse me, that non-economically productive land for biodiversity and ecosystem services. Is that something that you guys are also involved in and responsible for? Or do you just focus on the crop production? We mainly focus on the crop production here. Um, So the Laphams have decided to, to hire a conservation manager separate from the the farm business. Uh, And he manages along with the the Laphams. Nick uh, Lapham has a background in conservation and environmental policy. So that was a major reason for buying this piece of property is the fact that it borders Shenandoah National Park and also borders a lot of agricultural land. So kind of that making sure that that transition zone is preserved. A lot of native meadows have been put up in on the farm to foster biodiversity and those kind of, you know, the idea is that agriculture and conservation land can work in concert together. So a lot of those meadows are great habitat for pollinators that help us in the orchard and our veggie crops also great habitat for um, beneficial insects that we really do feel like there's a, you know, biodiversity here that, that helps the agricultural side of things. There's a lot of, nesting boxes that have been put in on the farm for bluebirds and that eat insect pests. There's barn owl and screech owl and kestrel boxes that deal with some of our rodent pests. Um, So there's a lot of work that we feel, you know, is helpful here on the farm and the ag side of things, but we are not managing that in addition to our vegetable uh, and the ag operation on the farm. But both Casey and I have backgrounds in biology and ecology and, you know, what we studied in college and um, our few years of work experience after college were really related to those things and our interactions with the natural world. And so, um, you know, we like the idea of coming back here and trying to integrate some of the conservation work with the with the ag work and see how we can push those boundaries a little bit. So just to tip things to a little bit more of a practical perspective, I do know that one of the challenges of integrating wildlife habitat with vegetables is, um, you know, deer, woodchucks, bears, (laughs) uh, 
you know, all, yeah. all things that you don't necessarily want for a variety of reasons in your vegetable patch. How are you striking a balance there? Um, yeah, that's definitely true. We do have to deal with some of the, those wildlife pests. Um, we definitely have fences on the farm that surround our, our ag field. So, you know, we have eight foot deer fences around almost all of our veggie operation. Um, we have a highly electrified fence around our orchard because I mean, Shenandoah national park has one of the highest black bear populations in the country and they definitely come down and, uh, we actually have like two rows of honey crisp apples on the top of our orchard that they seem to prefer those the most and they'll they'll weather the the high electricity fence and go under and get those but they don't really make a huge impact on the rest of our orchard but we do have to take measures to prevent those there there definitely are certain areas on the farm where we have woodchuck populations and we do trap them um, but there's also some of the, the wildlife areas are kind of separated from, from the ag fields. And there are actually corridors that have been made that, you know, are, that's meant for wildlife corridors going from habitat to habitat so that they're kind of staying out of our vegetable fields, um, and using those, those corridors as a more preferential habitat to go field to field or not, not veggie field to veggie field, but, um, forest area to forest area or meadow to meadow. Um, but yeah, there are certainly times that we have, we have issues and, and we deal with those as needed. But I think overall we've found that there's more harmony that can be had rather than, than conflict. When you talk about those wildlife corridors, and I'm I'm looking at an overhead map of your farm right now, and I can see that you've got like three main patches of vegetables that are kind of long and skinny, and then two corridors that run through the middle of those patches, where really they are pretty wide and they're pretty distinct. And I it's it's easy to imagine animals, wildlife flowing through those areas and not being quite so distracted by, by the romaine lettuce. <laughs> That's what we hope for. <laughs> but the fences help as well. I mean, it's the combination of the corridors and the fences. But sure, yeah, we're hoping the coyotes decide to trot down the corridor rather than trot into the field where our chickens are. <laughs> that was actually something else that interested me when you were recommended about being on the show was the mention of the priority that you guys place on healthy soils and the work that you're doing with cover crops and crop rotation and the integration of the chickens into that. Can you tell us about how that system works in combination with the vegetables? Sure. Um, so yeah, cover crops are really important to me and it's definitely something that we got some experience with at Potomac Vegetable Farms where there's even a little more acreage to play with. Sometimes I wish I had a little bit, you know, we're pretty, we have a lot of rolling hills here being at the, on the foothills of Shenandoah. So we don't have maybe as much acreage as I would like to, to play with in terms of soil building and, and cover crops. Um, but we, we do grow on about 12 acres of vegetables each year, but we try, we have about 15 acres or so that are available to, to growing vegetables. So about three acres each year is just in soil building cover crops. And, you know, we, we have a relatively long growing season here. So we try as much as possible to, to get our veggie crops out as soon as we can and go ahead and put a, a cover crop in if, if it is being cover cropped. And then those three acres that are just devoted to, to cover crops um, will grow an overwintered cover crop and then a summer cover crop mix. Um, so generally here, I would say our main winter cover crop would be wheat mixed with crimson clover, and then we'll take that out and till it in, and then we'll put uh, sorghum Sudan grass and cowpeas and have that going and then mow it once or twice and get deeper root growth. And then we'll put a fall cover crop there as well. And with our, if we're doing soil building um, in a year, in a particular year, and just devoted to 
to cover crops and we'll actually let those cover crops grow um, in the spring much later and let them go pretty brown and even set seed and going more lignified so that the microbes are breaking those down and but doing it more to build soil rather than just a, a green manure um, layer. We did just purchase uh, a no-till drill as well. Um, that's just a smaller no-till drill that um, that's on a three-point hitch. I'm gonna. I did borrow one a few years ago to try some things here where we would trying to reduce some of our tillage on, especially on those plots that were just growing cover crop. Like we can just mow a cover crop like that overwintered cover crop and then go right ahead and drill into it a, a uh, summer cover crop, or we could do something. I have, I've also borrowed and hopefully, you know, this is something that's, that's continually ongoing and we're trying to get better and better at it. But um, using a roller crimper to roll down some of those cover crops, especially if it's something like rye or vetch, and that's another overwintered cover crop that I, I would use sometimes, and then roll that down and then just come right behind it, potentially on the same pass. If you have a, a we have a one tractor that has a front three point hitch and we can put the roller crimper on front, and then we have the no-till drill right behind us and then put that that summer cover crop in right behind it. Um, so those are some of the, the techniques that we use. Um, another thing that, that I really like is in the fall, um, our cropping system is a little bit different in the spring and summer, and we use a lot of mulch at that time. But in the fall, when there's less, less weed pressure, we will, for all of our brassicas, we'll, we'll transplant them out and do a cold, two cultivations on those and then we'll overseed um, crimson clover and just it usually forms this wonderful mat that we're harvesting you know those those fall crops much later than than possible to get a good cover crop stand established in the fall and then we'll have a nice overwintered um, crimson clover patch and that that's a great I think a great crop too to to mow to flail mow and then then do something using that no-till drill on um, establishing another cover crop the, the following year you had asked about the chickens as well and how we kind of rotate those through the fields we we've definitely noticed a, a huge impact of having the chickens on the field in t terms of weed pressure and just fertility we try to move the chickens every two weeks basically and moving them plot to plot on the farm and making sure that we're, you know, following both organic standards and food safety standards of not having chicken manure on the fields 90 or 120 days beforehand, uh, depending on the crop. But we do move them throughout the farm and their fertility and just the work that they do in terms of pests and, and weed control. Um, we really feel like that that helps a lot as well. And when you're talking about the work that they do, for weed control, of course, again, you said not in with the vegetables, but actually cleaning up weed seeds either after or before the vegetables, right? Yep, that's correct. Yes. And then those chickens, those are, they're making eggs and you're taking those eggs to market with you, right? Yes. Our, our eggs are actually quite popular at market. We, we sell out very quickly and, and people always ask why our eggs taste different and we're not sure if they actually taste different or not. But we've tried lots of our other farm friends eggs. Um, but you know, we it's definitely a marketing factor that we can tell our customers about how we rotate the chickens through the crop rotation, not with the, the cash crops, but you know, throughout our fields and um we have a picture of them at market and customers really like to see that as well. You mentioned the food safety aspect of having chickens around the vegetables. Of course, you're, you're doing that egg handling. And one of the things that I remember from the time that we had laying hens at my farm in combination with the vegetables was that like dealing with the eggs was always this particularly crazy element of let's get this done on Friday night before we go to farmer's market at three 30 on Saturday morning. And I'm wondering how you guys are handling that that egg processing, both from a, a time management standpoint as well as from a food safety standpoint. Right, good question. Um, we have t 
two people on staff that do all of the chicken care and those are just seasonal workers. You know, we talk to the folks at the beginning of the season and see who's interested. And then, um, you know, we pick two people that have said they're interested and we just train them really well. So hopefully that helps with the time management a little bit that we know they'll be more efficient than, you know, having this rotation of all of our seasonal workers. So those folks will feed and water the chickens every day and then they collect the eggs every afternoon and we just wash them right away. And then they go into their own separate refrigerator and they're washed in a in a separate room and the workers also wear different boots. So we have a set of poop boots <laughs> that anytime you're going out to the chickens, those are the boots you wear. You come back, they live in this room where the eggs get washed. Um, and then you put on your other boots to go out to the vegetables. So it's a daily process of collecting the eggs and washing them and putting them in their own refrigerator. I would like to thank you for the term poop boots. <laughs> yes, we have a lot of big signs around the farm. So there's a big sign that says poop boots, right? Where the boots should always be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so big signs around the farm actually points to another thing that I wanted to talk to you about, which is that you have a reputation for being really good people managers. And I mean, I'm thinking that the big signs around the farm are probably a part of that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that helps for sure. Um, I mean, we're going into our eighth season managing a farm. And um, I'd say for my first season working on a farm, I had some responsibilities of managing the rest of the crew. So this is 11 years in now. And um, I think I've learned over the years that the more signs I can put up, you know, the better that employees will understand my expectations or, you know, know exactly where things need to go. And, um, know the systems or have, have a point of reference to look back at if, if they need it. And that's just helpful on, on a large farm. I mean, we talked a little bit about, or you said you were looking at a map of the farm. Our growing areas are really spread out. Um, so within this 420 acres, we do have four major growing areas and then there's a farm center sort of in the middle. So you know, our, our workers can be on, on any area of those growing areas and Casey and I aren't with them that often once the season gets started. So if, if we can make sure we leave um, signs back at the farm center for how things should be processed or where things are going to go, if, if we're not there, then it just makes the process easier for folks. And there's not that as much as like, oh, well, why didn't they do it that way? Or, you know, they put this in the wrong place or, you know, just the frustration that well, isn't inevitably probably going to come up at some point during the season. But the more we can just lay out the system that folks know where things are going to go, then the better they feel too. Like they haven't made mistakes. And that's part of how <laughs> I like to manage folks is just, if I can be clear or, or put a clear system in front of them. then you know, of course, everybody likes to feel like they're doing a good job and they don't want to be reprimanded as much for doing a bad job. So we're just trying to give them the tools to do that. I actually think that's, that's something, the importance of which cannot be underestimated. Helping people to do their job right in the first place and kind of providing them with the backup system so that, you know, you've showed them the poop boots once, but then there's a clear <laughs> sign about the poop boots and even, even having a word like poop boots that makes it really clear what you're talking about. Right. It's not, you know, <laughs> right. these aren't the, these aren't the chicken boots. These are the poop boots. Cause it's really, really clear that the poop does not belong with the vegetables. And so there's all kinds of, there's, there's some coding written in, in that as right. well, you know? And so I think, I mean, I really like that example of, of helping people to get things right, you know, really giving them the yeah. tools that they need. Yeah, I mean, that is important to us. We, I mean, we like to retain workers also <laughs> just to make our jobs easier. And I, I do feel like folks appreciate the effort that we 
put into teaching them and training them and making them feel successful. Like they are doing a good job and they're contributing to the progression of the farm over the season or even the, the long term, longer term visions we have. Um, so we do, we actually have five people coming back this year and, and we're really happy about that. And one of our longer term goals are that people see this as a, a job option and it's not something that, you know, they're like embarrassed about telling their parents they're working on a farm and, um, and then, you know, their parents are asking, well, what are you, you going to do with that? Or is that really a career? And, you know, we're really trying to help some of our employees overcome that and just, you know, create a model, hopefully that this is a job like how Casey and I ourselves worked up from being interns on farms to being managers. And that if you choose to, you know, work in this line of work, that there's a path to follow and you could continue doing it for many years. You mentioned that you have somebody who's in a, in somewhat of a management position with the orchard and the blackberry production. Do you have other people working in management positions under you guys? Um, not currently. We did ha- have an assistant manager last year and unfortunately she got Lyme disease and has taken some time off of farming. Um, but we've brought on um, a, a couple. They're coming back for their third year with us and we're adding them on onto salary and giving them health insurance this year. Um, we're, it's, an, it's a new step for us. So we're trying to figure out what kind of job titles to give them. Um, but we definitely have ideas after having worked with them for two years of what their responsibilities will be and how they'll help us with the marketing and the, and the crew management. Now, when I hear you say things like putting them on salary and, and giving them health insurance, I'm, I'm imagining somebody listening to the show who's, who's got their own farm and they're, they're, they're working to get established and they're building their own infrastructure and they're, they're buying their own tractors. It, is, is your ability to do that a function of somebody else owning the farm? Or does this all actually fit into the cash flow of the operation that you talked about earlier? I think our ability to do it is based on some of our marketing outlets actually and the the cash flow. And we're in the DuPont Circle Farmers Market in Washington, DC. And I think it's one of the best farmers markets in the country. So it's kind of scary to have so many eggs in one basket. I mean, that market is 55% of our farm income. So I think that helps us a lot to be able to offer these kinds of positions and be able to um, think about how we'd like to have benefits for folks in the future. Um, it's It's a big step this year that we're adding health insurance for folks on salary so that there will be five employees. Um, included in that this year, but it's taken time to get to that step of, you know, running the business for three years and getting to understand the numbers. And, and we're, so we're taking this first step to see how it works out. And, and then hopefully, you know, we'll be able to do further things like retirement. So I think, but back to your question, I mean, the market definitely helps us a lot. And I'm, I'm sure there are benefits to this farm being owned by non-farmers. I mean, we are um, blessed with a lot of housing. And I think that's a part of why we can retain people is that there is housing here on the farm. So I don't want to overlook that, that aspect of it. And in terms of just the, the relationship between the owners and the business, there are a few things that I wanted to mention that the the farm business, so the budget that we manage, we do pay rent back to the farm owners for use of the land and use of facilities. And so that was an amount that we decided on after our first year here. And then we are, are also paying the owners back for some capital expenses that went in to help us buy a market truck and a tractor early on. You're actually taking into account then in your bookkeeping system or in your accounting system, the capital expenditures and the capital costs of running a farm business. It's not just a, you're not just strictly on cash flow. 
then from the vegetable sales and the and the production expenses. Yeah, it was something really important to Casey and I when we moved to this farm and took over that. You know, we really are trying to run it like a business, and you know, we don't think it would be a great model for anyone if we just say like, oh, well, we just ask the owners for more money all the time. I mean, it's not, you know, or if we weren't really watching the books, I mean, we just, we came from a great business, you know, working at Potomac Vegetable Farms and, um, you know, we wanted to bring some aspects of that here and just create a farm business and teach our employees how to run farms in a way that makes financial sense. Great. I love that. And, and congratulations on that. I mean, that's, I think it's really important for farm businesses, especially because we so often serve as models for each other to, to really be conscious of the actual costs of running a vegetable farm, making sure that that is incorporated into your accounting, because that also makes sure that you're not in a position of going to the DuPont Circle Farmers Market and undercutting people who, who own their own operations and who who are making those investments themselves because you have actually accounted for that same set of expenses there. Yeah, that's very important to us to um, just be cognizant of our farm community and, and respectful of the other vendors as well. All right. So I think this is a good spot for us to take a break, get a quick word from a couple of sponsors, and then we'll be right back with Stacy Carlberg and Casey Gustavaro from the farm at Sunnyside. Perennial support for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is provided by Vermont Compost Company. Stacy had a few words to say about using Vermont Compost Company's potting soil. I like its consistency. You know, I feel like we've always gotten good transplants out of it. And it's just arrives in this big bag ready to go. Previously, we had been mixing components for our starter plants. And that could be really variable with different employees doing it different ways for the components not being the same each time. And so I like that we don't have to spend time in the greenhouse mixing something and we get really great plants out of it. And in our experience, the plants don't need additional amendments while they're in the greenhouse, you know, between the time of seeding until the time of transplant that they're getting enough nutrition from the Vermont compost that they look great when they go out into the fields. And I really appreciate that I don't have to add additional amendments in the greenhouse. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is also sponsored by Local Food Marketplace. Are you trying to scale up without the right systems? Instead of juggling email and text orders, spreadsheets for harvest, packing and delivery, and a separate invoicing system, Local Food Marketplace's software platform will help your farm automate these tasks and decrease errors with its fully integrated system for online orders, inventory management, order packing, invoicing, and payment processing. Easily configure the system for managing multiple sales channels, customer types, price levels, and delivery routes. The platform also offers a lot number traceability system and an option to collaboratively sell products with other producers. Contact them via their website, localfoodmarketplace.com, to schedule a free consultation on how Local Food Marketplace can help you efficiently manage customer orders from Packhouse to your customer's doorstep. All right, and we're back with... Casey Gustavaro and Stacy Carlberg at the farm at Sunnyside in Rappahannock County, Virginia. There's a lot of complicated pronunciation involved in your operation. Stacy, do you have signs for the employees to help them with this? Did you say pronunciation? Yeah, that was a joke. <laughs> well, we'll just let that one sit there like a lead balloon. Okay. So before we went on break. Stacy, you were talking about the importance of the DuPont Circle Farmers Market at more than 50% of your sales as being kind of the economic driver of the farm that allows you to pay people well and provide them benefits. Can you talk a little bit more about that DuPont Circle Farmers Market? Sure. Um Currently, we just go during the regular season. It is a year-round market, but we aren't going in the winter. Um, and it's Sundays in Washington, D.C. It's a five-hour market. Uh, and we think of it a little bit as a, a bell curve at the beginning and the end of the season. We don't need as many folks helping us there. But in the peak of the season, um, especially when we have blackberries, so late, late July through early September, we can 
need 12 employees there um, at market just to keep the display stocked and keep cranking customers through the line. Um, nobody likes to wait that long. <laughs> so we'll have five cashiers set up at that point and, um, and then we can have a couple of people sampling and then five or six people just rotating around and um, offloading more things off the truck and restocking. Uh, so it can be it can be quite busy <laughs> at the peak, and um, I think we've we've done well there because of the people we hire. Um, you know, we probably have half half people from the farm um, come to the market each week, and then the other half of the employees are just folks in the city that have expressed an interest in working our stand or our regular customers, or we know them through the the restaurant community and, and they want to help us out. Um, but we like to have folks that are happy and want to be there and like to cook and can share ideas on how to use the food. Um, but, but mostly that they're happy. It's a lot of hours, um, you know, to be on your feet and the, the customers aren't always happy and you just kind of kind of let it roll off and, and move on to the next you know, the next 10 customers that are happy and, and, um, this very dynamic, um, Casey and I usually aren't ringing up customers. We're kind of managing the, the stands. So, um, we'll, and managing the, the back stock when we get to market and offload, um, We'll, we'll probably still have a, a whole nother vehicle full of food. So we bring a box truck and we bring a van and um, we don't have a very large area. So we, you know, fill it as full as we can. And then um, we're just constantly getting more inventory out and restacking it and, and making the display look really beautiful. So the customers that are coming in the last hour will have something that looks not quite as nice as the first hour, but <laughs> but it looks nice, and and that's important to us um, to really you know focus on those five hours and not kind of putter out after the after the first couple hours. Uh, and then part of managing the stand too is just managing the employees. So you know recognizing when one of your cashiers is really slowing down on math and she needs to take a break, and so. I mean, that person on break and rotating someone else in or just, just making sure that the stand is really, really running well for the whole time we're there. When you talk about the farmer's market being an ap- economic driver for you, is that a, I mean, it sounds like it's certainly a volume issue. You can move a whole lot of vegetables here, but is it also a high priced market for you? Yes. Yeah, it is definitely. I mean, DuPont Circle is definitely um, one of the higher priced markets in in the region but it's also a high quality market there's a lot of great vendors there it's definitely a center point of weekend activity in dc so there's a lot of people that that come through that market and you know i think it's managed well and people are 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 willing to to spend the money there and i think that's something with the dc region in general it doesn't see as much fluctuation as maybe the rest of the country with kind of higher powered government jobs and all the jobs that are related to the government. Um, I think that's kind of one of the, the reasons that we like this area in terms of marketing. It's just, it doesn't see too much up and down. So I do think there, it is a, a high value market, but we, we definitely gain the benefits of, of being in that one. Being in a high value farmer's market is great. Being in a high volume, high quality market is great, but it also makes it hard to stand out. What are you guys doing to stand out at the DuPont Circle Farmer's Market? I think there's a few things. Um, You know, I don't think anything is that complex that we're doing, but I think as Stacy mentioned, having really friendly people and the way that we manage the people in this, our, our employees in the stand is a, is a key part of it. Um, I think another thing that Stacy didn't mention, um, she loves to make signs for all the, the vegetables and they're really wonderful. Um, so signs on the farm and signs at the market um, are really key for us. There's, you know, if you check our, check the Instagram feed, a lot of the pictures on there of, 
of the signs at market and people, there's so many people that make comments about that. Um, so that that's another thing that does make us stand out. I think another thing is the variety of things that we grow. We, I love to cook myself. Um, and I love to try new things and things that colors that pop and different varieties of different things. So I feel like we, we stock things that make our displays um, really wonderful. And Stacy does a great job of kind of envisioning that and setting it up and um, kind of making the, the market stand easy to navigate, but also really beautiful um, and, and well stocked. We grow a wide variety within tomatoes and a lot of the, the summer crops, you know, is this, this region, tomatoes and peppers and squash and cucumbers do wonderful for us. And we try to have them for a full, you know, three months while, while they're doing well. And, um, we grow like 20 different varieties of hot peppers. We grow a nice mix of cherry tomatoes and, um, varieties of different heirlooms and, um, hybrid tomatoes. I mean, I don't think anything is hugely out of the ordinary that we're doing. Um, it's just a matter of how we, we display it really nicely and keep that continuous display throughout market and kind of don't, don't let the, the folks that come later think that they're any less important um, than the people that came in the beginning. How are you guys managing the money? at market. Stacy, you said that when somebody's getting tired and they're having trouble doing the math, you know that you're paying attention to that, you're not doing this with a cash register or with a with some sort of a of an iPad app or anything like that. No, we're still old fashioned um doing it in our head or with a calculator. So, it is challenging. <laughs> um we haven't thought about changing that yet. I mean, we I think it works pretty well. It's just dependent on being able to continue to hire folks that can do math. <laughs> 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 but we do, you know, we also use money belts. Um, DuPont Circle is a really high traffic area and folks have had cash boxes stolen. So um, everybody's just wearing their money right on them. So we know where it is at all times. And um, so there is there is a little bit of an art of learning how to to ring people up and um, and manage the manage the money in the belt. So whenever we have a new employee helping us at market, either if they're from the city or from the farm, they they definitely don't start out as cashiers <laughs> because it it takes a little bit of time um, just to understand the flow of the market and learn all the prices. And then, you know, we'll, we'll work them into the rotation at the end of the market when it's a little bit slower so they can get a hang of it, you know, before, before they um, work a market where they're ringing the whole market or, or um, right at the start when we're really busy. And then how are you deciding how much product to take to that market? I mean, again, because that's got to be a pretty high stakes decision for you guys. Yeah. I it is, uh, we take a lot of food to that market. <laughs> um, we do have a Saturday market the day before, which has been doing increasingly um, better for us each year. That's the rest in market. And so we'll take as much to that market as we think we can sell and a little bit extra. And, um, you know, what comes back from that market gets reprocessed on the farm. We look at it again. We'll dunk it if it needs to be, and then it'll it'll go to Dupont for sure. But you know, Dupont just is where we send everything that, um, that we have left at the end of the week, and or that we you know that we've harvested all week, and we've been holding it for the market um, because we we do think that's our best shot to to sell it all. Um, if we know we have way too much of something, then we'll reach out to um, either folks in our restaurant community or um, other folks in our farm community that um, might be running farm stands or kind of a collective CSA and see if, see if they want to take some of that excess off our hands. Um, But we really, I mean, we manage our inventory 
we've got it written down, you know, from our first market here to the state, we know what we've taken to market. So I definitely look through those records um, for what, you know, this weekend did in the previous year, if it was a good weekend or a slow weekend and um, just kind of match those amounts. And, you know, we definitely have notes of we sold out of this at 10 a.m. So we need to bring more and just really looking at those historical records to, to see how much we can bring there. And, and then we'll bring a little extra. <laughs> and you guys are a certified organic operation. And I know that when you watch the debate about organic certification and a lot of, a lot of people will say, well, you don't need to be certified organic if you're selling at farmer's markets because you know, the customers know you. I'm curious why you guys have decided to go that route since wholesale isn't such a big part of your operation. I mean, the business was certified organic under the previous owner and that was maintained when the current owner took over and we have decided to um, continue with that because we actually do feel like it helps us at our farmers markets in particular. Um, our, our Saturday market, the rest of the market, I believe we're still the only certified organic vendor there and, and people do seek us out for that. So, you know, we felt for that market that it was, it was important. Um, at the, at our Sunday market, I'm I'm not sure if it's as important. I do I do think we have some some customers seek us out for that. Um but I think also some customers think everybody's organic. <laughs> so it's just another um marketing thing we have to do to make sure we have it on all of our signs and that people know we are certified organic. I did notice that that every one of the little signs that you have with each of the vegetables where it says rutabaga for $2 a pound or fennel for $2 a head, um, that it does say organic rutabaga and organic fennel and organic tomatoes. Yeah. Yeah. It's just one way we're trying to distinguish ourselves at that. That's our really busy market. With that signage, that's a, I mean, I know, and, and we didn't do anything as fancy as what you've got, but just sitting down and making the signs for the products that we had at farmer's market, or we used to mark up a, a big chalkboard and try to try to have that look nice before we got to farmer's market. That's a lot of work. How do you find the time to do that? Um, I, I really enjoy doing it. So I will come home in the evening and work on it for a couple of hours. If I know, Oh, all the, all the new hot peppers are coming in this week. We don't have signs for them yet. Then I'll, I'll, I'll work on it. Um, so this is kind of calming and relaxing for me. Uh, but recently this year we started scanning all of our, all of our signs. So I'm trying to get smarter and work smarter, not harder, and just have the sign library um, in our computer so that we can just print them off and I'm not starting from scratch. But we've got quite a, We've got quite a good collection going now. And it looks like those signs are laminated. Is that something you're doing at home or is that something you're taking someplace else? We're just doing it. We bought a, a laminator from, from an office supply store and it was maybe a hundred dollars, but definitely worth the investment for how much we use it. And, and it's something our boys actually love doing. So <laughs> <laughs> it's like the time they get to play office. <laughs> right. So, right. you know, I'll have a set of signs and, and then I've got like three volunteers that want to laminate. So um, it does take time, but I think it's worth it for what we, we get out of it at the market. So one of the things that you guys mentioned early on in our conversation was that you have a division of responsibilities between the two of you that you have distinct areas of the operation that you're managing. How does that, how do those responsibilities divide out between the two of you? Um, yeah, so we definitely do divide our responsibilities on the farm. And I think some of it comes with just where our skills lie. Um, I definitely oversee more of the field management and planning uh, tractor and a uh, equipment purchase and overseeing any repairs that need to happen, um, overseeing the orchard and irrigation, uh, fertility, 
we, we make compost here on the farm. So doing that and overseeing that and then any pest control. So a lot more kind of the, the field stuff. Um, and Stacy does a lot more of the HR and crew management things. I, you know, we, we definitely share some of these tasks here and there, here and there, and there's some overlap. Um, I go out and, and lead a crew sometimes, um, especially on harvest days, but she definitely does more of the, the, the day-to-day crew management, um, a lot more with market coordination and making sure that's all going well. And we're, we're prepared for all of our, our market, uh, greenhouse management, wash pack management and quality control. I would say that's Stacy's in charge of all those other things. And I think there's, you know, there's probably some things that I've left off here, but that's kind of the, the basic breakdown. And there's definitely some overlap, um, but we've, we found that, you know, for our, our relationship, it helps to, to not overlap too much all the time. And, and, and also just in terms of responsibility, it, it helps to have a definite division um, of things. I mean, Casey, you mentioned that Stacy kind of manages the HR and, and manages the crew. Do you have people that are working under you with the tractor operation and the tractor maintenance? Um, yeah. I, so Alfredo, um, who's another one of our full-time seasonal staff, I definitely manage him more. Um, and he has some of his own management roles. Um, and then for the, the crew, I mean, we often on harvest days, Stacy and I are out there most of the time. Um, and I'll often lead one crew and Stacy will lead one crew. Um, or, you know, if there are other tasks that we're doing, we'll often break up and I might be leading, leading folks. Um, but, and then if there is someone who has, a, we generally don't have, you know, first year folks doing much, much tractor work. Um, but if there's someone who's been here second year or third year, um, and giving them more responsibility in those, those areas, I would yeah, oversee them more. And how do you guys manage the, the day-to-day operations on the farm between the two of you? You know, they, they get up in the morning and deciding what needs to be done today, or, or maybe it's deciding what needs to be done on a weekly basis and then executing that plan. What does that look like at the farm at Sunnyside? We definitely decide on a day-to-day basis. Um, I mean, early on the week, we'll, we'll talk about what we are trying to get done for the week. And we have a whiteboard in our meeting area and we just write it all down. And then that's something we go over with our crew on Tuesday morning. We consider that the beginning of our week. Um, most folks have Monday off after going to DuPont. We just share that with them. So they kind of have an idea of what's coming down the the pipeline for the week. Um, But then Case and I will just talk each morning before we meet with the crew and come up with an outline of what we're trying to get done for the day and who could lead what jobs and, and how we'll break up the crew. And so we start with an idea in mind, but you know, anything can happen once we get going. (laughs) Um, So we do rely on walkie talkies on the farm and, um, if Casey and I aren't going out with the crew and they've broken up into two teams, they can definitely be in touch with us. You know, if something looks awry or they really didn't understand our instructions, then they can just radio back. And um, so we, we manage that way if we're not with them. And we will regroup after lunch and have another meeting just to talk about what was done in the morning and, and they can bring up any problems. Um, something broke or you know, something's taking away too long and then we'll just decide really what our goals are for the rest of the day and, and, and head out again for the afternoon. And before the break, we talked about, about some of the signage that you have around the farm to help people get tools put away or to help them get the right boots on for the right operation. Do you guys use a lot of written instructions when you're communicating with your employees? Um, we do both verbal and written, um, more and more. I am trying to send folks out into the fields with a clipboard and, you know, just a checklist of these are the four jobs we said you all are going to do. And, and so they have, um, something to remind themselves, you know, it's, <laughs> we have a, 
we have a great variation in our workers every year from folks that, you know, have decided to be here for two or three years and taking it very seriously. And then folks that are brand new and they just don't even know, you know, what field they're going to. <laughs> they're kind of along for the ride at the beginning. And so, um, you know, we find that, you know, giving those outlines and sending it out to the field, it, it makes it easier for everyone to make sure they're on the same page. But, you know, verbally, with the, the, we do like the walkie-talkies because it's just a way they can check in if, if, um, if they're unclear or two people think something's supposed to happen one way and, and you know, the other two think it's supposed to happen the other way. We can just help, um, you know, resolve any disputes and, and they can keep working. You also talked about managing people with the goal of having them come back year after year. And you said you've got five people returning from last year. What are you doing to, to create that sort of a really healthy workplace environment that encourages people or makes people want to come back? Yeah, I think there's a few things that, that we do do. Um, you know, I think we have a pretty friendly environment with our, our workers. Um, and we are out there working alongside with them a lot. Um, and I think that that definitely helps uh, in the, the big scheme of things. Um, some of the other things that I think help us are just setting clear expectations of what, what people should be do should be doing and how it should be done and having that constant line of communication with them, but also setting expectations of like when they are going to be done with the day and that we don't run way over um, you know, obviously there, there are some days when a storm is coming and we have to get a bunch of plants in or, um, you know, there are days that, that sometimes it, it becomes long days, but overall, you know, we, we have a pretty set schedule and people know what, you know, we meet with them in the morning and the afternoon, they know what they're going to be doing. Um, we, you know, every once in a while, there's a little curveball, but we don't throw too many curveballs to them. And, you know, it's, it's an environment that we, we really want people to, to learn um, a lot by being here, but we're, we understand that, you know, we're kind of all in and we may work a lot more hours than they do, but we're not expecting them all the time to this to be like their end all and the only thing that is in their lives. Um, so I think that's, that's a big portion of it. Um, for people that we, that come back, um, we kind of touched on it before, but offering, figuring out ways that our business can offer some type of benefits, whether it be health insurance or retirement for more longer term folks, um, or putting people on a salary. Um, so we generally, you know, when you first get here, we, we do pay hourly. Um, and then, then if we were to have you back for more, multiple seasons and it's something that we're still still working with but putting them then on a salary uh, just a couple other things i would add is we do evaluations with our employees um, about halfway through their time with us and i think that's just an important thing to do and sit down and talk about you know these are the areas we think you're doing well in these are the areas we, we could see some improvement and um just to let them know that we are watching them but you know that they are an important part of the team and and you know this is a, this is what you could do to be a, a more efficient member of the team um and then we hire a big crew and i think um hiring enough people is is a key component too so that your current crew doesn't think oh gosh well when are we we're never going to get this job done there's so much work and um we do have the luxury of the housing to do that. And I, I recognize that, but I feel like during the hiring season, I'm, I'm always wavering like, well, should we get one more person or not? And then um, I had talked to Chip Plank from Wheatland Vegetable Farms many years ago. And he said, you know, your employees will never complain about not working enough hours. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, I think <laughs> that has stuck with me where I'm like, Oh, well, if we hire one more person, then, that will probably mean less hours for everybody else. And um, it's a double-edged sword that you have to be able to, you have to be prepared to manage that many people. Um, 
But yeah, we've never had anyone complain about not having enough hours. So um, we just try to try to make sure the schedule is reasonable for folks. When you say have to be prepared to manage that many people, what is that? I mean, what what do you, what do you mean by that? I mean, what's the difference for you in managing four people versus managing eight, for example? Um, I think just a lot of what Casey and I do is trying to be two steps ahead of of the crew and make sure there are enough jobs for that many people. And I'm sure you do that on any scale of farming that you're trying to to keep your workers occupied. Um, I hate. I hate if we have to wait and everyone's just staring at me. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I want to have enough jobs lined up that we know where they're going to go next. And if, and, and hopefully we know the next three jobs they're going to do. And I think that's just part of it that you've, that you've got a plan for each day and then you also have enough tools for each person to use and, and that you have enough skilled people to show the unskilled people the jobs. And so it's it's definitely a puzzle that, that we work on every season. And I, I like that we have so much seasonality that we can kind of work up to the peak. You know, in April, I don't have nine employees here. <laughs> you know, it's just like a gradual, we start with um, two at the beginning of March and then four by the end of March and then add a couple more mid-April. And it's it's a way for me to you know work up to that peak of when we have nine employees and and um, you just figure out your systems with your current crew and who's good at what and then you add a couple more and it's it's nice to kind of rev up slowly that way. Yeah, that sounds a little bit different than what we have here in the Midwest, where it's kind of like you know you go from zero to sixty in in a couple right. of weeks. So yeah. So Casey. I want to circle back to something you said, because you mentioned the idea of setting clear expectations with your employees. And I know from experience that that's easier said than done. When you, when you say setting clear expectations, what does that look like for you? And, and how do you actually go about doing that? And I guess determining those expectations and then communicating those to your employees. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the, the most important things that you can do. And I think we're still learning how to do that. Um, and we will continue to learn how to do that uh, throughout our career. I think for us um, going out, one of the biggest things is being with the crew for if, you know, no one's done it first. Um, or done a job or done harvesting of a certain thing that you're out there doing it with them um, at least for 20 minutes or so and making sure that they understand what, what the job is. Um, And then continually kind of not, I think there's a a fine line of kind of micromanaging and saying, you know, well, you being too much of a hover, um, but, but going out there and making sure that that they understand what you want them to do and being there with them for a job um, in the beginning and then having kind of, if, if we notice later on in, in terms of harvesting, for instance, um, you know, if we notice things aren't looking right. We, we don't yell very often here or pretty much ever. Um, we're, we're not big yellers and we're not that loud, but it, it's kind of like a more, um, you know, if we notice that the squash is coming in, uh, too big or too small and it's not meeting our expectations that we'll, we're not going to single out necessarily one person, but bring like a group in, um, and say, you know, this is, you know, we've noticed this happen and here's what we're looking for. Again, we're just revisiting this. Um, so, so I think we still have some, some work to do. Um, but also setting, like making sure that people understand again and again, um, this is, this is what we're looking for. And I think over time, uh, they definitely do get it. We're not afraid to revisit things if it seems like it's not going well or pull people aside that don't seem to be uh, working in the same way as other folks and just revisit the goal and show them how to do the job the way we want it done. One other thing that you mentioned at the very beginning of the show that I wanted to, I wanted to touch on was 
was Lyme's disease. You mentioned that your assistant farm manager got Lyme's disease and is is having to take some time now to kind of recuperate from that. And and I feel like this is something that's becoming more and more of an issue pretty much all over the country. And you guys are in a place where I think Lyme's disease is pretty common. Are there steps that you're actively taking on your farm to manage Lyme's disease and, and yourselves and your crew? As far as the crew, I mean, our system manager was actually the third, the third case we've had on the farm um, that really affected someone's health. So we do take it really seriously with the crew and it's in our hiring materials. You know, if we've hired you, it's in the arrival packet. Um, you should prepare yourself <laughs> um, for ticks. And these are the things you can do. And then, you know, I'm hoping people read that information before they get here. But then we, on their first day, we talk about it again in person and we have signs up um, in the employee housing, in the bathroom, and then also in the, um, in our farm center, in the, in the bathroom, just about, you know, checking yourself for tick bites and, and, um, and what the signs are of, you know, a tick bite that might indicate Lyme disease. So we've, we've got signage again, back to the signage. <laughs> and then we also provide um, in the, in the farm center, we have um, bug spray if folks decide they want to use it and spray on their pants or their boots or whatever. We make that available to them as well. But we definitely, if we've been out in a patch and I come in with one or Casey notices one, we will, we'll just reiterate it. Like, Seems like there were a lot of ticks in the spare. Yes, you all need to check yourself. Like, are you checking yourself? I mean, we do, we do become kind of parental in that way that I, you know, I feel horrible about <laughs> folks getting Lyme disease here. And we just want to make sure everybody has adequate information to, to watch out for it. On that really cheery note, we're going <laughs> to turn to our lightning round. But first, we're going to get a word from one more sponsor. This lightning round is brought to you by Haas Tools. Haas Tools is the complete solution for all of your market farming tools and supplies. Keep your rows weed-free with their time-tested, American-made wheel hoes and the best wheel hoe attachments. Their precision seeders have a proven seed plate design for planting a wide variety of seeds. And you can grow the best transplants with their heavy-duty PropTech seed trays. And keep your crops healthy with their drip irrigation and fertilizer injection systems. Haas also provides a comprehensive selection of conventional and OMRI-certified pest control products at the most affordable prices. Free shipping and outstanding customer service. Shop online or request a free catalog at haastools.com. Casey, what's your favorite tool on the farm? Um, I'd have to say, I mean, we have lots of favorite tools here, but I'm going to pick um, an offset uh, round bale unroller that we have on the back of our tractor. We use, a, as I said before, we use a, a lot of mulch for our spring and summer crops. So we'll have plastic mulch that we plant into, but then we buy a lot of hay mulch round bales and we can all, we have this tool that was developed by uh, the University of Kentucky and um, our friends down the road at Waterpenny got one and we got one as well um, that rolls out these hay bales and you know, have a nice thick layer then of mulch that is used for weed prevention and uh, uh, have nice moisture control in addition to the weed control, um, prevent disease. So that's one of our main growing systems. And we've done, we've used that system for quite a long time at different farms um, and done it with square bales, but having the, the round bale unroller that allows like one or two people to do it is is a great time saver and this this bale unroller so this isn't something that's grinding it up this is can you can you describe what this machine actually looks like yep, yep. so it's just um i mean cattle folks use them a lot and they're just put behind the tractor to unroll the the round bales of hay um but this is just offset. So you're going over the plastic mulch um, and it's to the side. So just a simple weld has made it to the, to the side. So you can hydraulically, you pick up the, the round bale and then kind of 
move it up and down with a hydraulic top link. And then it will just unroll as you go down, down the, the row. So rather than having, um, you know, people pushing a big round bale of hay, um, which can be a huge job or spreading out square bales, um, this just takes a lot less time. Yeah, I do. We, we used to unroll the, the hay bales by hand on our farm, and that was something that caused us to stop mulching because it was less than yes. fun. <laughs> yeah, so this is a good, it's a good tool for sure to, to make people not hate mulching. <laughs> is this something that you, were, that you bought off the shelf, or is this something that you had to modify? Um, it was modified, yeah. So it is something that we were introduced or to um, by a farm down the road, as I said, Waterpenny. They, an uh, extension agent from the University of Kentucky, knew that they did a lot of mulching, had seen them at a conference somewhere, and then was excited about there weren't many people using round bales for mulch in Kentucky. And he talked to them and uh, showed them this prototype and then they got one and then we got one here as well. But it is, it's, uh, you know, a common piece of equipment, the, the hay, the round bale on roller, but modifying it to be offset is the the thing that, um, and we just took it to a local welder to do that. Right. Stacy, I want to hear you top that with your favorite tool on the farm? <laughs> um, mine might be an unconventional answer a little bit. I, I, it's not necessarily on the farm, but I just wanted to say my favorite tool is using our farm community. Is that allowed? Go for it. <laughs> so basically, I think, you know, we alluded to earlier um, that, Chase and I really have like learning from other farmers in the area and we attended a lot of farm tours and have gotten to know folks and, um, you know, just through building that network over the years really led to, um, to, you know, the job that we have. And also I really rely on other folks for support throughout the season. Um, we do bulk ordering together and, and also with this orchard, um, suddenly this year we had 45,000 pounds of fruit. And before we were on this farm, I had never sold a piece of fruit in my life. <laughs> so, you know, beyond selling what we could at the farmer's market, it was just um, really nice to have this community of folks to, to call up and say, hey, we have organic apples. Do you want to add any to your CSA? Or would you like to sell some through your farm stand? And I feel like just maintaining those communities has um, has been so helpful to us over the year, years, many years. <laughs> and I, I, I don't take it for granted, for sure. Casey, do you have a favorite crop to grow? Definitely peppers and specifically hot peppers, I would say. We grow about 25 different varieties of hot peppers, selling them a lot at market. But then we also have um, a local fermentation company that makes uh hot sauce out of a lot of the excess peppers that we have. But I do think for us, it really brings a lot of people into our stand um, during hot pepper season. We have a nice display and again, nice to sign, nice signs of them. And we're definitely known as the, the pepper people. If you could only grow one hot pepper variety, what, which one would it be? <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> That's difficult. Um, hmm. It might be one that now I've been saving seed for a while. It's called Jamaican hot chocolate. And it's kind of like this smoky habanero flavor. Um, and I can't find seed anywhere, but I've been saving them for a while. So I, I definitely, there's, there's too many to choose, but I'll, I'll choose that one. All right. <laughs> and Stacy, is there, is there a favorite crop that you have on the farm? And because um, you said, really, and because uh, you said community with the tools thing, you're not allowed to say all of them. You do have to pick one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I can pick one. Um, I do really love growing basil actually. Um, it, unfortunately it's getting harder to grow in our, in our area with the downy mildew. Um, moving in a little bit earlier every year, 
but I'm not giving up yet. <laughs> and I just really enjoy the smell of it, harvesting it, having a group out there harvesting it, and and then we can sell a ton of it. And um, I feel like it's it's something I appreciate because it is here for a short time, and and I just like I like when it's here. Stacy, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Um, I would say just if your employees are doing something that is frustrating you, it it's your responsibility to change the system. <laughs> um, that's that's something that it's taken me years to adjust to, but you know, just having frustrations with workers and like, they're not understanding this, they're not getting it. And then just this aha moment of like, well, then you got to change it. <laughs> you know, like it's my job as the manager to, to break it down to, to um, something that works and that, that they can meet the expectations. And Casey, same question for you. If you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Um, this is a hard one, but I think um, it's still something I'm definitely working on. But if I could start even earlier, just setting up systems um, to keep really good uh, records um, and keeping things organized would be something that, that I would like to work on even before and continue to work on it now. But it'd be helpful to have have those those skills um, and things set up earlier. Awesome. Casey and Stacy, thank you so much for being part of the Farmer to Farmer podcast today. Thank Thanks you for, for having, having us. us. That was a nice, nice in sync finish there. I really like that. <laughs> well, thank you. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 160 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. You can find the notes for the show at the Farmer to Farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Sunnyside. That's S-U-N-N-Y-S-I-D-E. The transcript for this episode is brought to you by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk-behind farming equipment and high-quality garden tools in North America. And by Osborne Quality Seeds, a dedicated partner for growers. Visit osborneseed.com for high-quality seed, industry-leading customer service, and fast order fulfillment. Additional funding for transcripts is provided by North Central SARE, providing grants and education to advance innovations in sustainable agriculture. You can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast right in your inbox by signing up for my email newsletter at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. Also, if you enjoy the show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. We also love it when you talk to us in the show notes or tell your friends about us on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. And hey, when you talk to our sponsors, please let them know how much you appreciate their support of a resource you value. It really does make a difference. Finally, please let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmertofarmerpodcast.com, and I will do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running. <laughs>